Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April uh, 2018 community meeting of the ITB2 Transmark Foundation. Uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone, and I welcome you to the call today. Um, we will record uh, this, this session, and it will be available with all of the slides uh, in a day or so on our website, uh, as we usually do. The agenda today, uh, we're going to have a welcome uh, from Diane Keo, Executive Director. Uh, we'll look at, uh, again, review the board nominations and elections by members. It's coming up. Uh, we will also um, remind everyone about the Harvard uh, June meeting that we have coming, uh, announce the fall meeting uh, in Geneva, uh, and then have two presentations on I2B2, one on the, the upcoming release. 1.7.10, uh, and a very interesting presentation on Jupyter Notebooks. So I'd like to now turn it over to Diane. Diane? Hopefully um, it's uh, spring in your neck of the woods and uh, hasn't quite hit Boston yet. Um, if you were one of the runners in the Boston Marathon yesterday, congratulations. Uh, I, I was on the subway last night um, riding home with a number of the runners who, who were just like frozen to the bone. I don't know if you saw the, the weather here was, was just like awful, awful. So those people are uh, pretty amazing. Um, so I wanted to, um, Anuda, you can go to the next slide. I want to quickly, um, talk to you about the, the nominations and election for the, uh, the new board members that are that's coming up. And this will happen um, this spring. Um, again, just to remind you of our governance, governance model, uh, the, the members play a very, very important role in um, nominating and, uh, and electing the board of directors, um, as, as you can see here. So you can go to the Next slide. Okay, so here are the list of our current board members and the uh, members in the top that are highlighted in the light blue are the members that are uh, will be rolling off their term um, ends this um, spring. So uh, Russ Waitman, uh, Christelle Daniels, Brett uh, Davis, uh, Matteo D. Uh, Tomasio, and Jim Serum. Um, if you go to the next slide, I will tell you. Um, so Christelle and Matteo are interested in uh, being nominated for another term. So they will be they will be part of the nomination process um, and the election process. The others um, will be rolling off. So I mean that gives us you know really a, a, a five five slots for board members and um, potentially two of the existing. Um, board members will be reelected. So let me give you the timeline for this. Now, the, the way this works, and we've talked about this a lot, is the, the members okay, that will actually be the ones that will um, nominate and elect the, the board members. If you're not a current member, but you have somebody or know of somebody who would be really uh, important um, to be part of the, the board, you know, let find one of the members and let them know um, and, and have that person uh, nominate the, um, that person. So we, we moved up these dates a little bit. Um, May 1st, I'll be communicating to the members about the process. Um, uh, May 7th, we'll be requesting the nominations and then the ballots will be sent, sent out on the 12th. And then the, the nomination process will start on the 14th. Um, the reason we moved this up was because we wanted the, the new board members to be in place by May 22nd um, so they can uh, plan to attend the first uh, their first board meeting, um, which will be held uh, on the 27th, um, the evening of the um, of the June meeting. So that's the process. This is, you know, I'm, I'm, it's it, it's exciting that uh, we're gonna we're gonna reach out and and bring some you know new folks into the board. And um, certainly, if you're a member, um, uh, you know, please please either nominate or or definitely you know vote. Look at the we'll send you profiles on all of the people. Definitely vote for um for the folks that you would like to represent the um, the foundation. 
So next slide. So um, I'm going to let Rudy jump in and talk about the next two, the June meeting and then the meeting in Geneva. OK, thanks. Thanks, Dan. So uh, as hopefully you all know, uh, we've uh, set up the June meeting to be June 27th and 28th at Harvard Medical School. Uh, this will be the third year uh, that we'll be um, participating uh, following this year uh, Zach's precision medicine meeting um, and uh, have, holding a two-day meeting. A little bit different format this year. We're going to start with speakers on the very first day uh, and then uh, a set of workshops uh, that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute on the second day. Uh, and also, hopefully, uh, we'll have a poster session, um, possibly a hackathon. Um, we've got closing, close to 100 people registered already. Uh, there are a limited number of seats. So if you haven't registered, you should certainly uh, think about it. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't checked on the hotel rooms, but we do have a limited block of hotel rooms uh, available. And so it would be a good time to register uh, if you're interested in coming to the meeting. Uh, and certainly, if you're interested in a poster session, we'd, we'd love to have you um, present a poster. Uh, our speakers this year, uh, are, Zach will do an introduction uh, to um, to clinical computing uh, and in his uh, very uh, elegant style. Uh, we have John Halamka, who will talk about uh, emerging uh, models for data um, and um, George Church to give us his perspectives on open source and, and how it's changed things uh, over the years and kind of a look into the future. Um, Eric Praxlis um, will talk about, uh, hopefully he'll give us a little perspective on the beginnings of, of Transmart uh, and also talk more about uh, open data and what um, what was coming uh, in the future. Uh, Becky Steck from the University of Michigan uh, will talk about one of the largest groups using uh, Transmart in the nephrology department at University of Michigan and a little bit about some of their experiences and what the, the, the software has contributed there. Um, Paul Viak uh, will be uh, introducing the I2B2 Transmart platform. We're expecting that to go into beta in the next uh, week or two, uh, and uh, he'll give us a you know uh, an overview of what's what's there and what we can expect coming into the future. Uh, and then Sean will give us uh, some uh, 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 interesting ideas in terms of where I2B2 is going in terms of big data. Uh, and also uh, a little bit more on the integration with Jupiter um, that we'll also hear a little bit about uh, in a few minutes. Um, on the second day, uh, we had a number of working groups uh, set up. These are the working groups of the foundation that have been meeting regularly and they will uh, have open sessions. Hopefully uh, if some of these topics, user interfaces, ontologies, ETL are interesting to you, uh, you'll come and uh, participate in the sessions. A uh, couple of special interest groups on uh, advances in software, in particular open source software. Uh, we'll uh, have a session on Open Bell and also scalable genomics. Uh, but we're certainly open to other topics. And so if you have ideas, please uh, let us know. You can give us ideas through the website or email uh, any of us uh, directly. Um, we'll have an ACT session uh, from the Shrine team uh, on kind of the, the future and what's coming. Uh, and they're going to be taking a whole day uh, for this session and uh, have some uh, open uh, discussions and um, uh, perspectives in terms of how things are going. Uh, and then Paul, Paul Viek and his team will be setting up a whole day uh, on the technology uh, and capabilities within uh, the I2B2 Transmart platform, uh, a deeper dive into the picture uh, APIs and um, some other uh, topics uh, that they will be discussing. So. This will uh, be a, a pretty packed uh, open day, a day and uh, hopefully, again, you know, your participation will be really uh, important for that. Uh, and the, again, the logistics are it's uh, two days uh, at Harvard Medical School um, and uh, the registrations have been open. The poster submission site is open. And uh, please, um, if you need a hotel room, we, ha we do have some special rates for you uh, at the inn at Longwood. Um, one other quick note, um, the DBMI Precision Medicine Conference is the day before our meeting on the, uh, the 26th. This year, uh, the topic uh, is assembling the puzzle. Uh, and as usual, uh, Professor Zach Cahone has put a very uh, exciting program together uh, and a, a, you can register for it. Uh, there's a lot more information at the DBMI website and uh, the website of uh, the conference. So if uh, this is interesting, uh, you can give you a, a really 
uh, interesting three days uh, at Harvard Medical School, uh, attending both the uh, the DBMI Precision Medicine meeting as well as our two days. So the other thing I just wanted to mention quickly is that uh, we have now um, been working with the uh, the academic I2B2 European Users Group uh, to uh, organize the the fall meeting. Uh, they've actually found uh, a very exciting location in Geneva, uh, which we have now booked. Uh, and this is on Campus Biotech, which is a, a very nice building um, that we can use. Uh, this was formed by a consortium uh, of uh, Swiss uh, universities and um, Federal Institute uh, of uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, it's a very beautiful campus with some great conference facilities including a very nice large room for us to use. Uh, it will be take place on two days, October 31st and November 1st. Uh, and our, uh, the, the foundation's um, working group on events is working with uh, the I2B2 uh, European User Group Organizing Committee, uh, Jean-Louis and Christophe. Uh, and we're uh, starting to, to gather our ideas and working on uh, logistics. So I want to just at least mark those dates in your calendar if you can make it. Um, to the meeting, uh, and we'll be uh, having a lot more information about that coming up. So that's what I have. Now we're going to switch to two presentations on I2B2. Uh, we'll be starting um, with the um, first presentation uh, by Janice on the I2B2 uh, 1.7.10 7 release. So give me a second, and I will change. To that presentation. Okay, Janice, are you there? Yep. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yep, that's fine. We're gonna try and not hang we're gonna try and not hang up this time, Dave and I. Um Apparently, we can do whatever we need to on a computer, but not on a phone line. <clears throat> uh, the phone kept hanging up on us, so we apologize for that earlier. So for those that uh, you probably see my name around on certain emails or whatever, um, my name is Janice Donahoe, and I work uh, primarily with the testing and release stuff. Uh, with the I2B2 and on occasion I will try and help out if I can on any of the install uh, emails <clears throat> and Dave is one of our developers who does a lot of um, the UI uh, stuff with the web client will work with Mitch's team and um, so forth what I wanted to do was just to take some time there's a lot of slides to go through just because there's a lot of new features um, added into 1710, and we're just going to really um, touch upon some of the things. But the 1710 documentation will have more details in it as far as setting up and so forth. Um, but I wanted to give you just an idea and also to point out some things that were worth mentioning in the release. Um, so that they don't get glossed over when reading the documentation. So Rudy, if you can go to the next slide. Basically, um, all three components are gonna need to be updated with 1710. There are database changes. They're minor, but uh, they are necessary. There's a new column added in one of the tables. Um, the server is updated and also the web client. And what I did to make it easier for this presentation, but also uh, in the documentation is I've categorized the enhancements this time. So there's miscellaneous improvements. There's improvements with logging, um, basically like kind of like auditing type stuff, uh, password management improvements, and then also query improvements. Before I go any further, one thing I do want to point out with this release that's different with the other ones, is usually uh, what we try to do is make sure that all of our releases before we release them we ask the shrine team to test them to make sure that every release is compatible 
with the Shrine software so that any Shrine networks won't have any problems and we've verified that it works. This release is going to be an exception. Um, we are not going to have it verified ahead of time that it's going to work within a Shrine network. What that means is, um, so for those of you who are part of a Shrine network, you can use it, but you cannot use it in your Shrine network, meaning you can use it locally, but not on your local instance of Shrine, if that makes sense. Um, so it cannot be part of your Shrine network until the Shrine team can verify it. There was a scheduling conflict, so they're not available to verify it at this time. Um, once we hear otherwise, then obviously we will let um, you know. Um, so that means that the ACT network, the CORI, so forth, you will not be able to use 1710 in your network at this time. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Rudy. So in the miscellaneous improvements, one of the things that we've done is we've created a single sign-on. So for those that are familiar with ITV2 and the way that we do the updates and installs, is we've always had the admin module separate from the web client. So you installed the, you updated the ITV2 web client, and then you had the admin, which was part of the ITV2 server. And a lot of times that was cumbersome and it was repetitive because the admin module was the exact same thing as the web client. Well, we've now made it so that the, you only have to do this once. You're only going to install the ITV2 web client now. So it's made it for easier installation and maintenance. Um, so now when you provided your user is set up as an admin, when they go to sign on, they're only going to go to the web client. All users are going to go to the web client. If I'm an admin now, when I sign on, if I have more than one project, I'm going to have to select. And you'll see that there'll be a project called administrator. When I select that, that's now going to bring me right into the admin module. You no longer have to have the admin uh, folder set up on your server. In fact, we won't be including it anymore in our packaged um, zip file of the server code. This is going to prevent the, some of the instances where we were having in 1709 when we packaged up our server code. Some of the files were getting out of sync with the web client, and we had to do three different packaging of the 1709 code. Uh, so this should eliminate some of that. Also, you'll see that it's sometimes in the, the GitHub, uh, people were forgetting to also go and grab the web client to, to then copy over the files to, to create their admin. This is no longer going to be necessary. Uh, on the next slide, Rudy. This one, I put a little star on it because I wanted to point out that this is an example of where uh, you as members of the community have submitted the fix to us and we looked at it and we're like, yep, this is the right fix for it. We took the fix and we implemented it in this release. Basically, we improved the data source validation so that now that we validate the database connections better and that if a connection within the pool goes bad, we're not going to use it anymore. Uh, before it was getting hung up and things were were going wrong. So this is an example of what they submitted. Uh, we looked at it and we took it. Um, and just a shout out to the person that submitted it. It was William Schumann from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Okay, next slide, Rudy. And obviously we'd like people to do that more because this is where we want more of the community to start um, taking over and, and helping and submitting these things. And the developers will look at these things and when you submit it into JIRA and, um, and see how they can fit it into the code or they'll ask you for more feedback as far as uh, if they have questions on it and so forth. 
So going on to some of the logging improvements, basically there's two things that we've done. <clears throat> really should say login auditing. Basically, we're now going to log all successful and failed uh, login attempts. There's a table called PM user login. So now you'll see two new codes that will show up. Bad password, meaning as a demo user, if I instead of type demo user uh, as my password, if I type just, I don't know, Janice as my password, it's going to log it as bad password. But then I'm like, oh, wait, my password is demo user. I'm going to um, have a successful log. It's going to log it in this table, so you'll continually see that now. Um, and then also the other one is in the admin module. You're now going to see that in the same table, we're now going to log all the functions that any user does, any administrator. Um, all the service calls. In this example here, this is someone adding a new user uh, in the admin module. You'll see get all user because the person had just signed in, so that was one of the functions, the service calls. And then get all user because now they've clicked on manage user, set user because they just saved the user, and then get all user because they just refreshed the list. Next slide, Rudy. And I realize I'm going through these quickly because there's a lot to go through and I don't want to um, spend too much time on it um, because I want other people to have uh, time for their. So here's the, the ones that I'll probably spend a little more time on because these are the tricky ones that I want to kind of point some things out. So the password management improvement, there's a total of four new features. Account lockout, mandatory password changes, prevent repeat passwords, and then enforce complex passwords. Now, obviously, these are relevant if you're just using the standard I2B2 passwords. Um, so, next slide, Rudy. So, for the account lockout, what this is, it's basically user lockout, if you want to refer to it as that. There's going to be a threshold that the admin, the site admin um, can set. And basically when, let's say you say users can enter a, the wrong password five times or four times, once a user hits that number of failed attempts, they're going to be locked out of their account. How long are they going to be locked out? Well, the admin gets to determine that period of time as well, and that's in a number of minutes. So once they receive that lockout, let's say they're locked out for five minutes, then they cannot get into their account for five minutes. They will receive this lockout message that says, too many invalid attempts, you're locked out, basically. Sorry. Sorry, Charlie. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in order to do this, there's now two global parameters. And for those who aren't familiar with what global parameters are, some may have uh, heard them called hive parameters. Basically, they're system-wide parameters. So it's a parameter that you put in. You can put it in through the admin module. Um, and once you put in a high parameter, it's for everyone. It's not for a specific project. It's not for a specific user. It's system wide. Um, the two parameters are called PM lock max count, and that's for the threshold for the number of failed. So you'll see the parameter that I have there is four. They're, um, once they put it in four times wrong, they're locked out. And then I have on the wait time, five minutes. And that is minutes. That's not like five days, five hours. That's exactly minutes. Um, the table that it goes into, for those that are familiar with the tables, is the PM Global Params table. But all this will be in the documentation. OK, the next slide, please. The next slide, 
So the mandatory password change. There's a couple of things that I really want to point out on this one. Um, what this one is, is that for those sites that want to force their users to have to change their password on uh, X amount of days or whatever, um, this will force them, you'll notice in the picture that I have, that that's actually the login screen that's kind of behind the scenes there. And I set it up so that it would expire in 90 days or whatever. Um, as soon as you, so basically there's, the password's gonna expire and once it does, next time the user goes to log in, they're gonna be forced to mm -hmm. change their password. Uh, so they'll have to put in their current password and then what their new password is going to be. Um, we, ch we cleaned up some of the wording of the screen. Um, there's going to be a new global parameter that basically turns this feature on and it's going to be turned on for everyone. It's not just for one user. It's not for one project. Again, it's a global parameter, so it's turned on for all projects and all users. And then there's gonna be a new user parameter. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Rudy. Before I get into some of the other things, I just wanna give you, and this will make sense in a minute, why I'm giving you this quick summary overview of how the password expiration process is going to work. So basically, you enter the global parameter and it turns it on for all users. And all users, as soon as you turn it on, all passwords are going to expire. Um, the user is going to attempt to sign in and they're going to have to change their password. So if you are turning it on at your site, you want to let users know ahead of time FYI, your password's going to expire because they're all going to be like, what is going on? My password just expired. I didn't know this was going to happen. Um, they're going to enter in a new password. And once they successfully sign in with this new password, the system is going to then use the value in the global parameter to calculate the next expiration date for that user and will automatically add a user parameter with that new date to the correct table, which is the user parameter table, um, the PM user param table. So if you can go to the next slide, Rudy. So here's the two parameters. They're both called the same thing. They're just in two different places. The global parameter is going to turn the feature on, and it defines the password change interval. The user added when the password is changed the first time. The date, and that one, the value is a date of when the password will expire for the user. Now, if you go to the next slide, Rudy. Now. This is the big thing, and this is why I put it in big R, and so even I can't forget to tell you that this feature is turned on for all users, including your service accounts. So if you have a service account other than the AG service account, which is the standard I2B2 service account, because we have taken care of that one for you. But if you have another service account in which you do not want that password to ever expire, you're going to need to take some extra steps. And I will, it is outlined in the documentation what you need to do. Basically, what you want to do for that instance is you want to either, as soon as you turn that global parameter on, go into the user parameters and manually add that user param or you can even add it before you turn that global parameter on because it will never it won't get overwritten <clears throat> and set a date far in the future basically i put the instead of 2018 i put 
3018 and it worked it didn't blow the system up so you can put a year so far in the future that none of us would none of us would ever see it and it won't expire um, so that is an option for you um, because obviously you don't want your service accounts expiring because then your queries or whatever you're using the service account for uh, will start failing and you'll have issues okay the next slide please Rudy. this one <laughs> Funny thing is, is we never realized because we never thought someone would want to do this until we uh, created the new feature of requiring passwords to change is that the system allowed us to use the same password. So if my password was demo user, I could change it to demo user again. Well, that was a loophole with requiring passwords to change. So now we don't allow them to use the same password as the current password. Uh, we don't store uh, historical passwords, so it's, it's only gonna be good for the current password and their new password. Can they use the one, can I use demo, demo user, change it to demo, and then demo user again? Yes. Um, however, <clears throat> they at least can't change it uh, to the same one it is. Okay, next slide, please. Complex passwords. So what this is, um, is for sites that want to enforce users to have to have more complex passwords, or uh, so you'll see the warning message that will pop up if someone is not, um, meeting the requirements when they set their, their password, whether it's uppercase letters, lowercase numbers, special characters, and you, the, as the admin, can set the complexity of what these um, passwords need to be. It'll be another global parameter. Uh, one of the things that we did is we said not to start or end the special uh, passwords and special characters because we're finding that the way that we pass our passwords, some of the browsers don't like you ending or starting your, your passwords off with these special characters. So we just said, don't use them. Um, next slide, please, Rudy. This just kind of goes into that basically each of the requirements are independent variables, um, but they're basically stored as one long <clears throat> string, if you will. Um, and I'll show you in a minute how that's done. But what I want to point out is that the only one that is required that you absolutely have to have if you're going to require, if you're going to turn on complex passwords, is that last one. Um, and that basically tells the system that the password is a string and it must be, in this instance, eight characters. You can change that number eight um, to whatever length you want the, the number of characters to be, but you do have to have that. And then you can, you can use these in any combination that you want. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this just kind of goes over a little bit of what I said, but so um, if you were to use all of them, uh, that's what your your whole value parameter value would be um, that you would um, put into the admin module when adding the global parameter or the high parameter. The next slide. Basically, a concatenation of all of them. So for the query break, query improvements, um, I'm just gonna go over the first one, but there's two of them, and Dave's gonna go over the second one. Um, he did all the work on the second one, so I wanted him to just kind of show you some of the, the neat stuff that he's, he's done to do that. The SQL query breakdowns, what that is, is basically it's custom breakdowns that are based on a SQL query. So basically we provided, and I'll show you a little bit of it, 
four new breakdowns as examples that are included in the demo data. And what we've done is you can now have, if you go to the next slide, Rudy, I'll show a little bit of what you can do. So the four examples we provided are length of stay, top 20 medications, top 20 diagnoses in inpatient and outpatient. So if you go to the next slide, Rudy. So for instance, for the sequel that is in the um, length of stay breakdown. So in the QT breakdown path table, you'll notice in value. So you'll see that there's actual a SQL statement. And I pulled that SQL statement out and kind of blew it up so you could see. So when you select that breakdown when running a query, it's then going to use this SQL statement uh, on top of the query that will then run. And if you go to the next slide, Rudy, this is what it will return. So if I had selected length of stay, but I forgot to put the check mark there, over on the right-hand side of your screen is what the report coming back would give me using the demo patients, which is why there's 133 exactly. Um, it shows the breakdown and the counts, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for those patients on their length of stay. So looking at that, looks like about 40 stayed two days, um, four stayed 17 days in the hospital, and then there's a graph below it as well. So if we go to the next slide, I think it's gonna start days Yep, so basically what I'm gonna do is turn this over to Dave um, because he has done all the work on creating a new uh, user interface for temporal query stuff. Hello everyone, uh, I'm David Wang, developer here at Partners, and I've worked on the temporal query, uh, new temporal query interface for 17.10. And today I'm gonna to show you what this temporal query interface looks like. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, feedback from our current users saying that the current temporal query interface is kind of difficult to use. Uh, it's very hard to keep a mental picture of what events are there, which ones are before which ones. It's hard to remember your population constraint uh, and has a pretty steep learning curve. So in this version, we've We've devised a new interface we call the simple version. Uh, it will display the ordering of events. Uh, it will display the population constraint all in the same page. Uh, the, the features have been streamlined, uh, so it's easier to access them. And there is an in-app tutorial in, in case you forget how to use them. Uh, please go to the next page. Uh, I'll start by showing you how to launch this new interface. We will go to the uh, query timing dropdown uh, that's in the current interface. Uh, we click on that. I go to the next page, please. And I've blown up uh, the dropdown. It was, we've uh, give, given the, each of the choices a new name. The first two are clear, clear non temporal query choices, and the third one says temporal query define sequence of events. Once you click on this, we'll go to the next page, please. You will see a brand new interface in under the query tool uh, page. And in this interface, there is a button on the top that says turn on tutorial. And this will walk you through all the features of the, uh, uh, of the new interface. And I'm basically gonna walk you through the tutorial, but in a different fashion. So in, a, in the first page uh, here, it tells the user to drop a concept into the box and to start building your temporal sequence. Uh, next page, please, Rudy. And let's say I've dropped in the concept hypertensive disease. Once that concept is dropped in, two panels will appear to the users. Uh, each of the panel represent an observation. And what we want to uh, what we want the users to do is construct a sequence of observations 
that the user is interested in. So uh, in, obviously in a temporal sequence, you need at least two observations and we have completed the first one. So let's drop in a second observation. Uh, next page, please. So we drop in the acute myocardial infarction. So now we have constructed a valid temporal sequence. It's saying that we have a hypertensive disease followed by an acute myocardial infarction observation. Okay, so this is a observation, uh, a sequence of, of observation that users are interested in. Uh, furthermore, the uh, link in the middle uh, describes exactly what the temporal relationship between those two observations is. It's saying that start of the first ever observation A, which is hypertensive disease, occurs before start of first ever observation B, which is acute MI. And this relationship is customizable to the users. And I'll show you how it, and then all they need to do is to click on the link. So I will show you what it looks like when they click on the link. Uh, next page, please. The temporal relationship editor, uh, a temporal relationship editor will show up in the, in the simple interface. And there are several choices that users can make. For the start off uh, drop down, users can select either start off or end off. For first ever, uh, users can select the first ever, the last ever, or any. And the other choice is describes how observation A relates to observation B. And users, users can choose occurs before, occurs on or before, or occurs simultaneously with. Uh, with these choices, uh, users can edit uh, how the relation, how the observations relate to one another. And you will notice in the last drop-down box, we only have before, on or before, and simultaneously with. We don't have after, uh, like the old uh, interface offers. And the way we do after is uh, we would typically we would just drag the uh, we would drag the panel and move them directly that, uh, via direct manipulation. Uh, please show the next page. And basically, we'll use the mouse, drag one observation over the other, and they will they will spot they will swap their spots so that uh, in this case, I'm dragging and dropping observation B in front of observation A. Uh, next page, please. Once you've constructed a temporal uh, query, you might only want to apply that to a subset of your patients. And the way to do it is you will build a population constraint. Uh, the way we build it in a simple query interface is I would click on the bottom uh, title that says show constraining population. Uh, next page, please. Once you click on it, you will see a very familiar uh, query tool appearing. And this is where we, we will define how, where we want to apply our temporal constraints. And here I've constructed that we're going to apply these constraints to females uh, who are between the age of 35 and 54. And once you've done this, uh, oh, by the way, the population constraints is completely uh, optional. You don't have to build a constraint if you want to apply your temporal uh, query to the entire database. Uh, next page, please. And once you've done this, you can simply click on Run Query, and it will run just like before. Uh, next page, please. Uh, we can switch this simple view into advanced view by clicking on the top right button there that says Switch to Advanced Temporal Query. The Advanced Temporal Query is simply the uh, the, the one that we the temporal query interface that we had in 17.09. Uh, uh, next page, please. And once I click on that button, uh, you will see my population page, uh, sorry, my population constraint showing up on the right-hand side, the, the big screenshot my, with the female and the age. And if I navigate through each of the events, I will see event one is my uh, acute MI, uh, my event two is my hypertensive disease, and the sequence of events, I can also see exactly what I defined. So you can switch easily between the simple mode and the, um, the advanced mode. 
Uh, and the only caveat is that if you're using any uh, features that the simple mode does not support, you will not be able to go from advanced to simple. Uh, go to the next page, please, Rudy. Uh, the features that the simple mode does not support include uh, nonlinear temporal sequences. So you can imagine if your temporal sequence includes any sort of cycles or bifurcations. Uh, simple mode also does not include multiple panels uh, or number of restrictions. Uh, and I think that's it for my presentation. Uh, any questions, you'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next, we have one more presentation. Um, it's uh, on Jupyter Notebooks. Unfortunately, our time's getting uh, short. So Mike, can we uh, ask you to try to go through this fairly quickly and maybe we can have a follow up on more detail uh, the next meeting, Mike? Yep, okay, can you hear me? Yes, sounds, yep. Okay, great, so um, yeah, so the next screen, I can go through this fairly quickly. Um, for those who are attending the uh, ITP2 meeting in June, I think I'm going to be presenting something similar to this. So uh, it will be in more detail. But anyway, so back in 2011, there was the IPython notebook, which was the predecessor to the Juniper notebook. Uh, this was kind of, think of it as version one. And this includes like a rich uh, web client. You could do some math and text manipulation. You could code in it. You got the results, and you can get a, a visual display. Um, as the name implies, IPython, this was mainly just for Python. Uh, next screen. So after, so then Juniper kind of was version two. And so in Juniper, it included a lot of the stuff that the IPython allows you to do, but it also allowed for multiple um, languages, such as like R or MATLAB, other, other languages. It also included a notebook file format so that it could be used across multiple different, uh, uh, multiple different formats. Um, next screen. Uh, yeah, so this is basically kind of was grabbed straight from the Juniper notebook. Uh, it allows like for pluggable uh, authentication, uh, centralized deployment. Uh, it's container friendly so that it can use with, such as Docker and stuff like that. And then it allows you to kind of uh, code and then data put uh, with the data and then put text around that. Okay, next screen. Um, okay, so what? So the Juniper Notebook is consists of basically three components. Uh, the first one is the web application, which is similar to the IPython one. The other one is the kernels, and the kernels are separate um, processes that run the code uh, in, in, in the given language that you specify. And then you got the uh, the notebook document documents, which is basically where you can kind of uh, write documentation around this. Um, this could be used if you're doing like a research paper, you can write uh, um, latex around it and then uh, print it out and that would be a presentation or whatever. Okay, next screen. Six minutes, okay. So basically, uh, this is a saved, uh, being uh, saved, so I'm not going to go into every aspect of it, but basically, it allows you to enter the code into a web browser, using a web browser, and you can do uh, indexing, you can run the code, you can see the results, you can save it as different formats. Um, and then you can author and narrow the text around it. Okay, next page. Uh, so the kernel, so this is just uh, eight of the main uh, top kernels, but of course any kernel language that you wanna use. Uh, Python are very popular, and then you have Node.js, and then Scholar, uh, Shaskill, Go, uh, Ruby, and Julia. Uh, so these are, but you can only use one kernel at a time. Uh, that's one of the limitations. Okay, next page. Uh, so this is basically just uh, putting documentation around your code 
in the round of Juniper notebook. Uh, it does the latex, like I mentioned, for equations. Uh, you can do uh, like HTML or just standardized text. Uh, next page. Uh, okay, so now we talked about Jupiter for a while. What about why are we talking about it in an ice beach transmog meeting? The reason being is because we developed a little application. It was a web plugin that would allow you to take a patient set and then run queries against that in the notebook. So it consists of basically three, um, <laughs> so like uh, the back end PHP code and then the JavaScript code, which is a web plugin. And then it uses, um, th so there's two different ways you can make a connection to the I2B2. You can use a PDO XML, or in this case, I did a direct database connection, mainly for performance. Uh, I was able to pull down like hundreds of thousands of records every, every couple of seconds. So it was fairly quick. Um, but the limitation of that is it is a direct database connection. So it's hard coded or in some config file or something. So if you change uh, the I2B2 one, then you're also going to have to change this one. Okay. And you can also constrain by concepts. So the next page. Okay, so this kind of shows, so once you went through that little wizard, what it does is it will create um, six tables within a Jupyter notebook, uh, one of them being the concept dimension table, one being the observation fact table, and the other one being the patient dimension. Um, it also included a header file for each. Uh, the newer version I just finished up on, it just has three files, the headers included in the top of each of them. Okay, so it, so you run through the query and it basically just exports these three files directly into your notebook and then you see them on the left hand side. On the right hand side is an example of trying to use one of those configuration files. In this case, we're using the observation fact and this is um, basically loading up the observation fact and then it's gonna display information about it. Uh, so the next page, so in the left-hand side, this is just running through it. Running through it, you can see that it has the, uh, in out 330, that has the, uh, the headers of the observation fact. And then in the bottom part, it says, okay, so now we want to go based on the constant dimension and the C number. And this is basically counting the number of uh, constant dimensions uh, and the value. On the right hand side is a more elaborate one where it has the count also, but it also has the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the top 20%, 50%, 75%, and the max. And the concept CDs are various different concept codes. So this basically demos what you can do once you export the data and a little bit of Python, a little bit of R, and within the Jupyter Notebooks. And, uh, so I think there's another screen, if I remember correctly. Nope, it was just questions. Okay, and so yeah, right on time. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, yep. So we have not much time left, but if there are any questions, burning questions anyone has like to ask, we could open it up right now. Or you could raise your hand or touch on me in the question window. This is a little bit uh, quick today and a little long. I don't see anything. Um, just want to make one note. Uh, Ward from uh, The Hive reminds me that uh, he, he worked and, and has put a nice uh, short entry into Wikipedia for uh, Transmart. And so that is now there. Um, finally got approved and, and loaded up. So. Check out Wikipedia and search for Transmart. Uh, I think that's it, Diane. You want to say anything in closing? Um, just um, thank you for joining. And um, remember, we have um, working groups, CTL, user interface, and ontologies that are um, that are active. And um, and uh, please, if you're interested in joining, um, go to our webpage and sign up. Otherwise, um, we will talk to you in May.
Thanks, everyone.